happy to be here. Even more than happy, though, I've got joy. Has anybody else got joy? Man, joy is so much better than happiness. We kind of talked about that just briefly last week as we got into this new series, a short series, only three parts. Last week was part one. If you missed it, go check it out. This is part two this week, and it's simply called More Joy. Turn to a neighbor and say there's more. How do we know that there's more? Because seven separate times in the New Testament, we see the Greek word for joy, kara, right alongside this other Greek word, which is a little harder to say, but we're all going to say it, plerau. Say plerau. That's right, you've learned some Greek now. Plerau, in each of these seven instances in the New Testament, when you see it alongside kara, means to render perfect or to complete in every way. So that means when it comes to your joy, it can actually be made complete. Or your joy can be to this new full fullness. Is anybody interested in that kind of joy? Yeah, I am too. I thought y'all would want to see it. That's why we're in this series, because I'm so tired, number one, of seeing Christians go around like we're sad and we got nothing to be excited about. And number two, even if you can't have good circumstances, how many of you know the joy we have in Christ is something that's not dependent upon our circumstances? It's something that we can have because God has poured it in. It's something we walk in in the Spirit, and no matter what's facing us in life, we can have this joy. And it's such a revelation to me that not only can we have a joy that's sustained, but that biblically we can actually have more joy. There's all these ways to do it. So last week, we checked out three instances, and they were in three separate places, 1 John, 2 John, and Paul's letter to the Philippians. This week, we're going to look at three more instances where we find where we can have more joy, a joy made complete. And all of these instances are from one dialogue, one conversation, if you will, between Jesus and his disciples. All of these occurrences happen the night before Jesus goes to the cross. I feel it's especially appropriate in this season as we're only a few weeks now from Resurrection Sunday And I agree with Matt, the greatest event in human history. Because if Jesus is dead, then what are we here for? But he's not. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And it's this joy that he's talking about before he goes to the cross. So he knows on this Thursday night that on Friday, the cross awaits. That agony awaits. That the wrath awaits of the Father for all sin, for all humanity, for all time, is about to be poured out onto him, yet he still goes to the cross. Why? Well, Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. So as he's there that night before, he has his closest companions around, his disciples, and he starts to tell them very vividly, hey, things are about to change. Things aren't going to look like they have. I'm not going to physically be with you much longer. And understandably, Jesus' disciples are distraught. They're confused. They have these questions. They can't really understand what's going on. Yet Jesus, throughout this discourse, tells them, not only can you have joy, but you can have it made complete. So we're going to start in John 15. Starting in verse 9. Jesus says this, Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my, what? Commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's, what? Commandments and remain in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my, what? Commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Hmm. So Jesus says, Just as the Father has loved me, 
I have also loved you. Remain in my love. So when we think about love, our minds usually go to maybe like a movie or something, you know, like at the end of the movie when the characters have danced around each other the whole movie and they finally get to that last scene and there's that perfect kiss scene, you know, or maybe you think of love and you think about that perfect someone you're praying and waiting for, you know, or maybe your mind goes back to when you actually felt like head over heels. You had that emotion that everybody talks about when they talk about love. Most of the time when we think about love, we think about something like that. We don't think about commandments. Command is not in our love vocabulary, if you will. But Jesus here is saying it over and over again. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I've loved you. You are my friends if, I do, if you do what I command you. See, the love of God is tied to the commands of God. The love of God is tied to the commands of God. And as it turns out, so is our joy. These things, Jesus says, I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So these things, that's what Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So what are these things? these things that he's talking about. Well, the immediately surrounding verses suggest that it's the keeping of God's commandments. It's right there. What, why, what, what things am I talking about? Stay in his love. Do my command. So you want your joy to be full? Remain in Christ's love. Want to remain in Christ's love? Do what he says. I know this is mind-blowing, right? Keep his commands. I mean, commands are good. Well, let me say it a little different. God's commands are good, right? Did you know that what he commands you to do is actually for your good? Did you know that what he tells you is actually for your benefit? Did you know the boundaries he gives you are actually to keep you safe from harm and to keep experiencing the goodness that he has for you, they're put in place for a purpose. And that purpose is for you and everyone around you to thrive as he created you to. God's commands are good. I think somebody needs to say it today because you don't really believe it yet. Say, somebody say, God's commands are good for me. Oh, they are. God's commands are good for me. They help me. Like, if you can turn this corner in your life, your life's going to be better. Like, let me just tell you, if you can get around this hard, because it's hard. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I haven't been here my whole life. Not, definitely not my whole Christian life. I never, uh, hmm. I, I never knew that everything God told me to do was actually beneficial for me. You know, if you can, like, get around this turn, I'm telling you, you will start to walk in more joy. Like, because if you're not, like, sometimes we have this, like, I don't really think that's for my good. It, we think that God just, like, holding out on us, or he's keeping us from things for no real reason. Oh, don't do that. Don't touch that. Don't get involved with that. And there's no real reason backing it. But when we think that way, we make out God to be some joyless tyrant that doesn't like to see his children happy. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, it says he rejoices over us. The Bible says that God takes pleasure in us. Like that's the God of the Bible. And any boundary that he has, any law that he's given, it's actually put in place for the good of his people. Check out Psalm 19. Here's just a few verses from it. It reads like this. The law of the Lord is perfect restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. 
They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, much than pure gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, your servant is warned by them. In keeping them, there is great reward. See, when we keep God's commands, when we do what he says, we experience more joy. So point number one of the day, number four for our series overall, is if you want more joy, keep Jesus' commands because then you remain in his love. Point number one of the day, keep Christ's commands, thus remaining in his love. See, when Jesus says this, John 15, 11, when he says, these things, I tell you, these things he's talking about is at least keeping the commandments of God. Now, he might be talking about even more stuff. He might be talking and referring to everything he's already spoken about thus far in the conversation, starting way back in John 13. And in that, he's talking about loving each other, serving each other, the coming of the Holy Spirit, abiding in him, producing fruit as you walk with him. Now, all of those things can produce joy too. I can tell you in my own walk with the Lord, when I've seen any of those things happen and I'm walking closely with him, I'm even more joyful. There's more joy in my life. But it's safe to say at very minimum, when Jesus is speaking here, he says, if you want joy made complete, it at least involves doing what he says. I mean, think about it. Doesn't it only make sense that you would only experience full joy when you do what he actually says to do? Or let's say it the other way. Doesn't it also make sense that you wouldn't experience full joy when you're not doing what he tells you to do? I mean, it's right here. Fullness of joy is tied to obedience. And then I don't want you to miss this other part because this is really good too. This other part of verse 11. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. Oh, don't miss that. He says, my joy may actually be in you. I mean, are you kidding me? This is the joy of Jesus, the joy of the Son of Heaven, the Son of God. That joy can be in me because that's what he says. Now, this might not even surprise you because you don't think God's capable. It might surprise you because you don't think Jesus is joyful. Because somebody in here, maybe not anybody in here, people watching later, somebody watching later, you probably have this image of God like he's always mad and upset. You might have an image of the father like he's this ratchety old man, you know, just yelling at the neighborhood kids about everything that annoys him. He's got this big stick just waiting to beat you up when you do something wrong. And somebody has that same image of Jesus as they have with the Father, that he's always upset and angry and mad, or maybe he's sad and subdued. And this is the image that you have of Jesus when he walked around the earth. But check out Psalm 45. Here's what it says. Your throne, God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You're like, well, yeah, that fits. Well, read on. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your companions. These words, written way back in Psalms, are fulfilled ultimately in Christ. How do I know that? Because in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the writer of Hebrews quotes these very verses and ascribes them to the Son of God. So that means Jesus Christ himself was anointed with the oil of joy, with an oil of gladness. That don't sound like no sad Jesus to me. That sounds like Jesus had joy all over him. And his joy must have actually been beyond that which anybody else ever experienced. That's what Psalm 45 says. It says he has more joy than above his companions or beyond your companions. That's the oil of gladness more than anybody else. It seems to me that Jesus actually had more joy than anyone. Isn't that crazy? He can be a man of sorrows because he bears the weight of the world, yet he has more joy than anyone else. 
It seems to me like Jesus walked around not... Why are we walking around all... It makes no sense. If we're to be more like Jesus, not only can we walk in the joy that he says we can step into by obeying his commands, but he says, you can have my joy, the capacity of which I can't even imagine. It seems to me like Jesus had a capacity that can't even be measured. It seems to me Jesus had more joy than anyone else on earth, any man, woman, child ever experienced. And now he wants to give it away? He wants to let me in on that? Like, I can possess that? Man, what a generous God we serve. Like, that's the kind of stuff you can't buy. You can't self-help yourself into that. That's the Lord Almighty saying, hey, you want to experience something that's impossible? Otherwise, hey, you can step into this. That's the joy of the Lord. And then he keeps going. Now, there's a whole lot here in this discourse about joy. And when you go back to read it later, I just want you to notice how joy is peppered all over what he's telling his disciples, even as he's going to the cross. But right now, we're going to drop all the way down to John 16, 23. I'm going to pick up there. And Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now... You have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that what? Your joy may be made full. Point number five, for more joy in your life, ask and receive from the Father in Jesus' name. Ask and receive as you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. I mean, who knows that when you get a, Prayer actually answered, you got more joy in your life. Yeah? Yeah. That's no, that's no rocket science, right? You get, a, you get a prayer answered, you're more joyful. Like, I can't tell you how joyful I was 10 plus years ago when I finally met Chelsea, now Chelsea Keys, after years of praying for a wife. I'm talking years. I was joyful. I wasn't just happy. I was full of joy, ladies and gentlemen. I was a happy, happy boy, full of joy. And I can't tell you how happy I was. So much joy. I can't tell you how happy I was last week as Xavier got baptized. After so many of us all prayed for him, for God to move on his heart, and he did. I can't tell you how happy I was last year when we prayed and God miraculously healed Matt Heron of his cancer. Gone. It's a kind of joy that's unlike any other kind of joy. It's the joy that God gives when he answers a prayer. But I also know what it's like to ask and not get what I ask for. I also know what it's like to ask of the Lord and it not turn out the way I want to. So how is it that Jesus can say these words that we read in verse 23 and 24 and then we not receive what we ask for? How is it that he could give us a promise like this? And yet sometimes it feels like when I pray, the prayers fall flat. I wish I had a perfect answer. I wish I could tell you that, hey, today, go home, do X, Y, and Z, and from now on, anytime you pray, it's going to be exactly like you hoped. But I can't. I cannot explain perfectly why God does what he does, and sometimes he doesn't do what I want him to do. I can't explain to you fully the sovereignty of God, his ways, his rulings, his judgments, why sometimes he says yes, why sometimes he says no, why sometimes he says I'll fulfill it, but it won't be in your lifetime. I, I don't know. But I can give you something. I can give you some grounding and some guidelines for prayer, and I can give you some hope. When we look at these words of Jesus, it is helpful to look at them in light of the entirety of Scripture. The entirety of Scripture. Because it's very tempting sometimes to take a look at one verse, ignore everything else, and build a theology around it. 
You know what I'm saying? You find one thing that you like in the Word. Oh, I like that one. And then you ignore all the context and everything around it. And you build a whole belief system around this one part. But that, my friends, is not good theology. That's not good handling of the Word of God. Because anytime we see one thing in the Word of God, we have to measure it against everything else we see in the Word of God. Not against my reasoning, not against my understanding, not against pop culture, not against the Republicans, not against the Democrats, not against what my grandmama said, but against the Word of God. Anything that's found in the Word is measured by everything else we have in the Word. Amen? And all these other places in the Word say much about prayer. Now, I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list, but other places in Scripture, for example, say it matters how we pray. It matters that we would pray with faith, for example. A different verse talks about how persistence in prayer is important. Other parts of Scripture talk about how our obedience to God's Word in our heart and in our actions actually impact how prayers are answered. If you don't believe that, go check out Psalm 66, 18 and 1 Peter 3, 12 later. You can read it on your own. There's other places that talk about how we're actually to pray for God's will to be done. There's an account where Jesus himself in Luke 22, I believe, is praying to the Father. And there we have an example of requests being made of God, but then an ultimate yielding to saying, well, not what I will, but your will be done. So we can make ask, we can make Request, but then to ultimately yield to him is also a thing. We see here that we're also to pray in Jesus' name. When he says, you've not done this yet, he's talking to the disciples. He says, you've never prayed this way before. It's because they either just came straight to Jesus or they prayed to the Father. They never prayed to the Father in Jesus' name. He says, now, look, it's it's fixing a change. I'm not going to be with you much longer. You're going to pray to the Father in my name. Not to me. You don't have to pray to me. You can pray to the Father. You can come in my name. And he says these crazy promises here. Ask anything. What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? That's a loaded question. Not only is it coming to the Father in the name of Jesus, but it might also mean coming in his character, praying in accordance with his will, with his nature and purpose that's been revealed on earth with, you know, fulfilling his will and mission. Like, there's all kinds of ideas. What's it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? I say all this to say, when there's prayer going on to you, or excuse me, from you to the Father, there's a lot at play. There's a lot of variables, okay? Specifically, there seem to be some qualifiers. So, for example, if we don't pray in faith, then something's lacking in our prayers. The Bible speaks to it. Or if we, um, what was another one? If we ask with the wrong motives, we might not get what we ask. Or if we're living in sin, the response to our prayers might be hindered because of what we're living in. So things we don't like to talk about, but it's the fullness of the Word of God that it has to be weighed against. All of these other scriptures show us there's so many things going on. And you might be thinking, well, Adam, why would I even bother? <laughs> like, why pray? You know, why would I even ask? Like, if there's all these qualifiers and all these things, I'm not perfect. Like, why even ask the Lord? Why should I even do this? Well, because you're instructed to. There's the one. We're actually told to pray. We're instructed to pray. Jesus told his disciples, hey, this is how you pray. He told them how to do it. Then you see Jesus modeling prayer. He's over and over again going to get alone with the Father, one-on-one. And the disciples see this. And we can't forget James 4, too, because this is another reason you pray. You do not have because you do not ask. Ye have not because ye ask not. So it could be that there are things withheld from you right now merely because you won't ask for it. If you'd ask, you might just come through. But um, I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared of being let down. And I'm going to tell you, honestly, I get it. Despite all of these 
qualifiers and despite even the potential letdown that's there when God doesn't answer like you want to, Jesus over and over, ask and you shall receive. Ask and you will receive. He gives this stunning promise here. Ask the Father for anything in my name and he'll give it to you. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. So when you do ask in faith, and when God does answer your prayer, I'm telling you, you are going to walk in a joy more full than you have now. But sometimes you just got to ask. Is he going to answer? I don't know, but you got to ask. Turn to somebody and say, ask. Ask, ask, ask. I could get in trouble saying that word a little wrong. Ask, ask. Okay, all right. Our final instance of the day that we're going to look at <laughs> is uh, of joy being made full. We're going to drop down one more time to John 17, verse 13. Is this practical enough? Is this a way to see some joy in your life? John chapter 17 is where we're looking. Now, this chapter, the entire chapter, is a picture of Jesus, the Son, praying to the Father. Now, there's other instances through in, the, in the Word where Jesus instructs other people how to pray. But this is the fullest picture we have of what Jesus actually said and how he communicated with his father. It's the entire chapter. And just one verse is what we're going to look at. Jesus prays to his father and says, but now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. One more time. Let's read it. It's one verse we're focusing on. Again, Jesus praying to his father, but now I'm coming to you. He knows it soon. He's going to the cross. He says, these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So we're again here, we're made aware of this incredible promise and this potential of the joy of Jesus actually being made manifest in somebody else which to me is just mind-blowing, just crazy. We can have the joy of the Lord, like literally. He says, you can have my joy in you, and it can be made complete. And he, he, he's praying to the Father, and he expresses, he knows, hey, I'm, I'm coming to you. Yet he says, I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So what things here is Jesus talking about? What things is he speaking that we might have his joy in us brought to fulfillment. I think it's everything you're going to read there in John chapter 17. I literally think it's everything that he's praying in this high priestly prayer to his father. And he's saying them out loud in the presence of his disciples. And all of those things help to make their joy complete. I literally think it's all 26 verses. Now, we ain't going to go into all 26 verses today. Don't worry. We're not going that deep today, I'd encourage you to, because I think every bit of it matters. But I also want to be real clear. Uh, I could be wrong in my opinion. It could be that when he says these things, Jesus is referring to everything he's already said in chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. The whole discussion. Maybe he's said the whole thing to them so that their joy can be complete. And they'll see it fulfilled and they'll see it happen. That brings them joy. It could be everything Jesus has ever spoken in their presence. It could be big and broad. I could be wrong. It could be the other way. It could be more narrow. Some people think he's just speaking here of the joy that the disciples are going to have even in the midst of their persecution that's coming. He wants to let them know you can have joy even as you're going through this. I'm not sure. This is one of these instances that I want to be so clear with you. I am unsure what this means here. Here's what I know. He says we can have his joy made complete. He says it to his father. The exact references he's making when he says, these things I'm saying, I am not certain. So point number three, point number six overall, how can I have more joy? I don't know. It's a question mark. How can you have more joy? Here's the question for you. What do you think John 17, 13 says? What do you think Jesus is saying here? When you read this, when you go back and study this, what is it that God is offering to us? 
And how do we obtain it? What do you see when you look at this verse? And I love it that I can bring it to you this way. Because like, I'm not big on like, hey, let's put somebody up here in a pulpit and just tells you, hey, go read your Bible, figure it out for yourself. Every week, I, that would be old, right? Be like, come on, teach us something. Um, but at the same time, I would love it if every single one of you would go to your own Bible and read it for yourself every week, right? Right? Like, this is to be teaching, upbuilding. This is to not be your only little bite of the week. You will be malnourished. You can't live on this alone. You'll get by. You may not die, but you're not going to be having joy to the full. Well, how can I walk in Jesus' commands? Aren't you going to tell me all of them? I ain't got time. You're going to have to read them. Get them in your heart. I say this to not bring it to you and just pass the buck, but I don't want to just give you my opinion on John 17, 13, and when there's many opinions that could be had. I wonder what you think. I also, if, if my opinion's wrong, I don't want to be like telling you the wrong one, acting like it's the only thing. It could be many. The point is this. What do you think about this? My challenge to you is this this week. Go read John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Read five chapters. It's one discourse from Jesus. The longest one in all the Bible. And when you read it, see what you think he's saying. Notice how joy is all throughout it, even as he goes to the cross. As he reminds his disciples that he loves so much that, hey, things are about to change. The world is going to be celebrating that I'm gone and you're going to be weeping and so sad. But when I come back, your joy is going to be made full and they can't take your joy away. I want you to see the fullness of what's here, way more than I can talk about in a message. I love bringing this last point to you like this today with a question mark because I want to encourage you to see what you think about it. Yes, I want you to have more joy. Yes, I want you to start walking into the fullness of what God has for you in this area, but I want you to do it not just because I say it or because you see the point on the screen, but because you believe it, because you see it from His Word. It's a different conviction when you're not living on the points of the pastor, but you're living on the word. It's the living, breathing goodness. It's just There's something different about the word of God. It's living and breathing. It will change you. But you have to get it. <laughs> there's like... like I can cheerlead it for it every week, like, get in your word, get in your word, get in your word. If, y'all, if, y'all, if everybody watching in here would get in the word, we would change not only this community, but we'd change the world. Because we'd start to believe who Jesus says we are. And we start to walk in the things that he says that we have. What do you think John 17, 13 says? Because you might pray this week, he might give you revelation he hasn't given me yet. You know, you could say, God, I don't understand this. Please show me. And boop, he shows you. Because you know God answers prayer, right? We've already seen that. So that's my challenge this week. Go back and read this discourse, this Last Supper encounter. And see what the Lord tells you. See what you think about it. Maybe you take a chapter a day. Maybe you read the whole thing at once. Whatever works for you. But each time, here's how I encourage you to do it. If you don't do this yet, And I know many of you have expressed, like, I don't like reading. Let me give you something really practical. Number one, just listen to it on audio. (laughs) But but number two, (laughs) audio is fine, man. Hearing comes by the Word of God, right? Or faith comes by hearing. There we go. Hearing by the Word of God. Um, But yeah, do audio. But also, before you even listen to audio or you start to read, you can say, God, I hate reading. (laughs) But help me love your Word. That's an honest prayer. Because it's different than anything else. And then say, Lord, would you show me truth today? Would you show me what I need to see from your word? Would you just show me what's real and what's true? Would you show me any falsehood I've bought into? Let your word and your truth shine a light on any error I've walked into. Bring me back to the truth. Bring me back to the light. And I believe that as you pray those things, he will lead you to truth. His truth which is the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
And when you start to walk in his freedom, that's where you're going to find joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your perfect word. I thank you that there's a way to have a joy made even more full through you. Lord, I receive and believe today that I can have the joy of Jesus in my life. Lord, I pray that over every person listening and watching today. I pray that your joy would be made full in your people. That we would be your people evidenced by the joy that we have. A joy that's different, that's otherworldly. That's not based on superficial circumstances, but that's grounded and based in the goodness of who you are. Lord, I pray today that you give people a hunger for your word, that you would help make it alive. And for those of us who just don't like reading, Lord, give us, give us a fresh hunger, a fresh way of understanding. Lord, even if reading a magazine or a text wears us out, Lord, that you could help us love it when we open your word to see what you have to say. Lord, I pray all these things boldly today, and I pray that you would make us a people full of joy. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, I love you guys. Have an incredible week. Go in the joy of the Lord, and we'll see you next week.